we want it. We need it. We must have the pressure. <coughs> The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. So The Two Towers came out in 2002 and is part two of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. There are a lot of twos in that sentence, but anyway, this picks up right where Fellowship left off. Gandalf fought the Balrog, was taken down into the mountain, never to be seen again, everyone presumed him dead. They end up on top of a mountain somehow. Not quite sure how you get from the bottommost pit of Moria up to the top of the mountain, but they did it. They must have fought for a long time, Gandalf eventually smote the Balrog. Smote, smoted? Smote, is, s smited. He killed the Balrog and he also died as a result, only to be brought back as Gandalf the White. But we don't know that quite yet because we have to catch up with our hobbit friends, Frodo and Sam, as they go on their own to Mordor to throw the ring into the fire, you know, complete the quest. But it's here where we properly meet the creature that's been following him this whole time, Gollum played by Andy Serkis. And the special effects that they used on Gollum was groundbreaking for the time. It was one of the earliest examples of using the real facial expressions of the performer into the CGI character. And for this being a 2002 movie, the same year Attack of the Clones came out, Gollum holds up pretty darn well. And I don't know if I should give the credit to Andy Serkis or Weta who did the actual CGI or Peter Jackson for getting this incredible performance out of a dude in gray spandex. Or maybe all three of them should get credit, I don't know, but they definitely pulled it off. And Gollum is an interesting character because he's clearly insane and he is a good example of what the ring was doing to Bilbo and is doing to Frodo right now if taken many, many, many more years. And Sam definitely doesn't trust Gollum right off the bat. He doesn't want anything to do with him. He says we don't need him. But Frodo sees a kindred spirit in Gollum because he knows how the ring torments you and messes up your mind. And if he can save Gollum, that means that he's not that far gone either. And while I'm talking about him, Frodo is also a much more interesting character in this movie because you really start to see the ring wear on him. He doesn't look nearly as sickly or depressed as he will later in the series, but you're definitely starting to see a shift from the happy-go-lucky Frodo of the first movie to that more weary Frodo that has to bear this ring and is kind of going a little crazy himself at times. But Frodo does win out and they start using Gollum as a guide through these mountains to get to Mordor. And from here on out, The Two Towers does what a lot of sequels do that have an ensemble cast. Now that the Fellowship is broken up, each individual group or partnership within that Fellowship are doing kind of their own missions. Like I said at the end of my previous video, Frodo and Sam are going straight into that volcano. Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are hunting the orcs that took Merry and Pippin, so that's a whole nother adventure. And you've got Merry and Pippin's little adventures with the orcs and later the trees. So for the sake of expediency, I'm just going to focus on one quest at a time and take you through everything that happens. So let's start with Merry and Pippin. So Merry and Pippin were taken by orcs in the last movie that seem to have been transformed into Urukai in this movie. I don't know, there seem to be a lot more Urukai here now than there were in the last movie. I thought it was just the one Urukai that got his head chopped off by Aragorn that was taking them away. But I guess there's more that I maybe misread or maybe that's a continuity error. I'm not sure. But anyway, Merry and Pippin are captives and they've been leaving breadcrumbs along the way to help Aragorn find them through the woods. That is until the orcs and the Urukai start fighting each other over whether or not to eat Merry and Pippin because they're hungry. And it's here we're introduced to the Riders of Rohan, a group of men led by Carl Urban as Aomer. And they slaughter all the orcs and Urukai overnight. They don't even see the hobbits. The hobbits scampered off into the woods and are now meeting Treebeard. And Treebeard is voiced by John Reese davis who also plays Gimli in these movies. I think that's kind of funny. And Treebeard is one of the Ents, which are these giant Groot-like walking tree creatures that tend to the forest, and they're, they're basically the Lorax. They speak for the trees. They make sure the forest is healthy and growing. And while the Ents are a pretty cool concept and they get to do some cool stuff later on in the movie, this is by far the least interesting part of the movie in my opinion. And it's mostly just because the ends are so slow. Everything happens so slowly and I know that's the point so I can't harp on it too much because the whole point of the ends is that they grow slowly, 
they walk slowly, they talk slowly. The Entish language takes an incredibly long time to even say the most basic of sentences. And I know that you're supposed to feel frustrated, just like how Mary and Pippin are frustrated with how long this is taking, but every time they cut back to the end, some part of my brain is just thinking, I could be watching some much cooler stuff with Aragorn or the Hobbits or literally anywhere else in Middle Earth, something more interesting is happening. That is until Mary and Pippin kind of trick Treebeard into taking him into the part of the forest that Sauron cut down all the trees. And as you might expect, Treebeard is none too thrilled about this and the ends rage war against Saruman. It's pretty awesome, but Isengard is only one of the two towers that you need to worry about. The others in Mordor, and that's, you know, Sauron's big eye tower. I know it has a name, I just don't remember it. But now let's talk about our two other Hobbit friends, Frodo and Sam. And Gollum is actually doing a pretty good job leading them through the swamps and marshes. He has a couple really impressive scenes where he talks to himself and whether or not to trust these hobbits and whether or not to just kill them in their sleep and take the ring for himself. And it's in these scenes where the characterization of Gollum really shines. And he is the most memorable character in this movie and steals every scene that he's in. And Gollum successfully leads them to the Black Gates of Mordor. The only problem is that they can't really get in through the front door because they'll just get taken and abducted by orcs. And that's not good, so Gollum starts taking him through a secret place. But not before they get picked up by a group of men from Gondor, you know, the city that Boromir was from. And convenient enough, Boromir's own brother Faramir, played by David Wenham, is leading those soldiers that pick up Frodo, Sam, and Gollum. And they have some questions of their own. And it's here where Faramir actually gets to seal a few scenes for himself because while he still has the same corruptibility that Boromir had, and you do see that, and this comes from an even greater desire to please his father, Denethor, who we still don't really know that much about. And because that Faramir isn't so tempted to take the ring for himself, but to take everybody to Gondor, which they do, and hand it over to his dad. But before they can actually take him to Denethor, Gondor gets attacked by... Bones! Yeah, the Nazgul just don't give up, do they? They're back at it again, but this time they're not on horses. They're on whatever these dragon nightmares from hell are. And if anybody knows the name of what these winged Nazgul creature dragon things are, I'd love to know. Leave it in the comments. And when I say Gondor gets attacked, it doesn't really get attacked attacked it's more just like a bunch of scouts just kind of flying around like vultures more than anything else trying to find this ring and it's here where Frodo is really feeling the weight of this ring and the corruptibility of it and it's just torturing him and Sam gives a really uplifting speech in his own Sam wise the brave way that's basically the darkest night is just before the dawn speech from Batman and that not only uplifts Frodo but it also gives Faramir a bit of a change of heart and he releases them at risk of his own life by his father. But now let's turn our attention away from the hobbits and focus on what the Warriors 3 are doing. And like I said before, they're still hunting the orcs that took Merry and Pippin until they find out from the Riders of Rohan that they were all slaughtered in the night. So then they investigate the orc massacre and find out that the hobbits did escape into the forest. So they go there and they come across not Ents like Merry and Pippin did and not Merry and Pippin themselves, but the White Wizard. And it's here where we get the proper introduction to Gandalf the White. And he's still played by Ian McKellen, and he is still amazing. But if I'm being nitpicky, I think I do still prefer Ian McKellen as Gandalf the Grey versus Gandalf the White. I know he has a lot more power as Gandalf the White, and that's really cool. But there's something about kind of the rugged, joking nature of him as Gandalf the Grey that I do miss here. But anyway, it's a great reunion. Gandalf tells him not to worry about Merry and Pippin. We've got bigger issues to solve. And that's the fact that Saruman's army is marching to Rohan. And that's a big deal. So they go into Rohan and they find out that the king, Theoden, is under Saruman's spell. No help to Grima Wormtongue, played by Brad Dorf. And if the name Grima Wormtongue wasn't enough to tell you that this guy is an agent of Saruman, the fact that he's played by Brad Dorf. Chucky, that should tell you all you need to know. This guy is bad news. And King Theoden is looking a little rough around the edges. He looks like he hasn't had a good shave, a bath, or any kind of lotion in a long time. And so Gandalf flashes him his whiteness, and the spell is broken, and Theoden, played by Bernard Hill, is back to his old self. His strength is returning to him. He's got a nice shave, a good 
solid Boromir-ish goatee, and he starts rallying his own army to defend Rohan at the fortress of Helm's Deep. And Helm's Deep is this seemingly impenetrable fortress built into the side of a mountain, so good luck Saruman getting into that thing. And when Rohan only has about 300, and that includes old men and young boys that haven't seen battle before, those odds still aren't too good, even if your base is carved out of the side of a mountain. And it's here where we definitely get the most epic battle that we've seen so far in this series, and arguably in the entire trilogy, and it's the Battle of Helm's Deep. When you see, if I'm going to be completely honest for a minute, and I know this may make some Tolkien fans cringe, it's the Battle of Helm's Deep and the scenes with Gollum that are the reason why I don't just skip over this movie and go straight to Return of the King. Now, I'm not saying the rest of the movie isn't fantastic. It's fantastically made, well acted, it's a good movie and a worthy successor to Fellowship and a worthy predecessor to Return of the King. It's, it's good for what it is. But the narrative structure of Lord of the Rings just has a little dip of interest to right around that two towers mark because it's the middle of the adventure. It's the slump. It's when everyone's getting a little tired and depressed and anxious and they haven't rallied into that finale yet. But when you have a series that consists of three three-hour movies and even longer if you include the extended edition, that's a lot of hours to be sitting in front of the screen. But luckily, between the scenes with Gollum and this battle of Helm's Deep where you see thousands of orcs versus 300 men fighting to the death. It's epic. There's different strategies that play out. It makes it all worth it in the end. And if you did skip two towers, you would be missing some really cool stuff. But speaking of stuff that kind of feels like filler, you have Eowyn, Theoden's daughter, who I know becomes a bit more relevant in the third movie. But here she's just kind of played as this maybe love interest to Aragorn. She's definitely got a crush on him, but Aragorn's already promised to live Tyler's Eowyn, the elf chick that does really nothing besides cry and ride horses. You could do so much better, Aragorn. And I know she's pretty, but Eowyn actually picks up a sword and has some grit to her, and personally, I'd rather see Aragorn get with Eowyn than Arwen. But because this kind of love triangle doesn't really go anywhere and it doesn't create any real conflict for anybody, it just kind of feels like filler, what can I say? And it makes Eowyn, a really cool character, feel a bit more shoved into the background just because she's from Rohan and really not a whole lot of people from Rohan really amount to much, which is kind of sad. I never really thought about that before. But Rohan gets a bad rap. Rohan deserves better. But back to the Battle of Helm's Deep, when all hope seems lost and they've retreated as far as they can go and the orcs are still piling in, who appears but Gandalf the White, and the sun rises, and Gandalf is not alone. He's with the riders of Rohan. Carl Urban and his company ride in, the cavalry has arrived, and they just destroy the Orakai, and the victory is theirs. But unfortunately, they did take some very heavy losses, and the war has only just begun. And even though Isengard is pretty much destroyed by the Ents, Sauron's power is still growing, and that's a big threat, and that's pretty much where they leave us for this movie. Just like Fellowship, it ends on a cliffhanger. You're not really sure what's gonna happen next. And the only definite detail that we get for next steps is with Frodo, Sam, and Gollum because they have to go through this secret path that leads to a tunnel with a dark terror inside. And we'll find out what that is in my next video. But until then, if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And also, why don't you comment below, since we're more than halfway through this series now, which Lord of the Rings film is your favorite? And as always, I'm Colby, this is my nerdy talk, and I'll see you in the next video.